morning. Good morning. Oh, thanks, Charles. <laughs> um, my name is Kara. Um, if we haven't met, I'm one of the pastors on the team here. And I'm so excited to be with you all for um, our summer of stories. Um, and as, if you guys have been paying attention, we've been talking about um, stories from the Old Testament. We've also been talking about the stories that we believe, um, the stories that we have learned and internalized. What is our story collectively and individually? Um, what are the stories we tell ourselves? But ultimately, what is the greater story that God is telling in and through us? And so I'm really excited to um, continue that story today with all of you. And a part of my story that maybe um, you maybe you know, maybe you don't know, is my lifelong love of ladybugs. I, for as long as I don't, someone laugh. That's real. <laughs> For as long as I can remember, um, I have been obsessed with ladybugs. When I was nine, my family decorated my whole bedroom. It was all ladybugs themed. Um, if you know the car I drive, that is why I drive that car. I drive a red car because I love ladybugs so much. That is the real reason. Um, and when I was uh, seven, I had a big imagination, as seven-year-olds tend to do. And I was um, getting ready to do my first science report, and I could pick the subject. And so, of course, I picked ladybugs. And I remember being so excited, going to the library, picking out the books I was going to use, reading them, doing my little report, and proudly presenting it to my family. And I got some weird looks. <laughs> and I remember my mom... I asked her about this this week because I was like, you were so kind to me. <laughs> she was so kind, like, oh, wow. Now, where did, you, um, where did you learn this about how ladybugs eat? And I was like, I don't know. I made it up. Um, sounds good, though, doesn't it? <laughs> and she's like, okay, that's not how it works. <laughs> um, but I had just added all this stuff because I was like, I want to make this a really good story. Like, how, how could I make, make this the best? Um, in fact, this week when I was asking her about this, this isn't in my notes, but I asked her about, like, what, was the, what, were, what were a couple of those things that, like, I made up or whatever? And she was like, well, I think it was around this. I was like, no, that's true. No, that is true. And then we Googled it. It's not true, guys. I still believed in a belly mess. <laughs> so I'm still working on this. We're all a work in progress. Um, but I was like, I just want to tell a good story. I thought that I needed to add, to embellish, um, to make, you know, ladybugs more enticing to the whole world, to everyone else. Um, but now the older that I become, the more I am aware that the stories that we tell, especially this, the, the reality of God's story and the story that he's telling in our lives, doesn't need embellishment. It doesn't need those additions. It doesn't need to be dressed up. It's better than any story that I could come up with, that we could come up with on our own, right? He doesn't need us to like add some fun facts in there, um, as I was as I was tempted to do. Not just um, my story, your story, Overlake story. Like there is so much um, goodness in our stories um, that we don't need to add anything. And as followers of Jesus, we say that this book contains good news, the gospel. And I love that the indigenous translators will say that this, the way of following Jesus is creator's good road, walking on creator's good road. And I also like to think of this as creator's good story. This is a good story that we get to be a part of. And it's a story for everyone, everywhere. And the beauty of walking creator's good road together means that there is room enough for all of our stories. Um, there's room for, for all of our experiences, everything that makes us who we are. And there's room for all of us. And this summer at Overlakes, we've been looking through stories in the Old Testament. Um, today, we're going to pause to look at the life of Moses. And a few weeks ago, Pastor Neely, one of her points was that the stories we believe shape how we live and similar, similarly, I think that the language that we use, like language matters, the language we use um, to shape those stories also matters. 
the stories that we believe shape how we live, but the language that we use in those stories is really important. And so today, I, I would love to invite us to do this. Instead of reading this as Moses's story, what if we saw this as God's story through the life of Moses? And here's what we know to be true of God's story, is that God's story is a story of liberation. This is God's story. It only takes us a few seconds to think about the ways that we need liberation. The world that we live in is in desperate need of God's liberation. We are surrounded by stories. Pastor Royce uh, mentioned this this morning too. Stories of oppression, enslavement, abuse, hatred, systemic violence, dehumanization, and genocide. And this isn't new. Uh, our need for liberation. Um, two chapters in here, we see, yeah, humans are in, are in need of liberation. We're in need of a savior. Um, up till now, we still are in need of liberation. We still are in need of God. And all of scripture points to the life of Jesus. We say this at over like a lot, that all of this story is a story of Jesus. And we know that Jesus is the greatest liberation story of all time. Liberation from sin and death, the power that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But it's not just the New Testament that tells that story of liberation. What if it's the whole thing? What if all, if, if this is all pointing to Jesus, even the Old Testament is telling a story of liberation to freedom and justice? All of this story. And so as we approach the text today, I just want to um, share some questions that might be helpful as we approach Scripture. Not just for today, actually, but any time that we approach Scripture. And here are some of those questions. When we read, let's ask, who holds the power? And how is it being used? What are they doing with that power? In the story, who are the oppressed? When we read, let's ask, where do we see humans at work? And where do we see God at work? And this is just helpful for us, especially if you've grown up in church. Maybe you've heard these stories multiple times for us to have a fresh look and, and ask the Holy Spirit to help us as we read this story together. And here's kind of where we're at in the story. We learned um, a few weeks ago about the patriarchs and the matriarchs. Pastor Neely was sharing about that. God's promises for his people. Now... Last week, when Pastor Neely was speaking, God's people are enslaved in Egypt. Last week, we learned about Pharaoh's command to kill all the Hebrew baby boys. And then we talked about the resistance of the Hebrew midwives. If you haven't listened to that message last week, I highly recommend you go back and listen to that message on resistance. So good. And, and it's connected to the story that we're talking about today. Because when Moses is born, this is, this is right when Moses is born, in the middle of this and he is hidden, miraculously kept alive. Again, there's so many miracles in his life, even from the beginning. Um, when that's no longer possible for them to keep him hidden, he is miraculously found, adopted into Pharaoh's family, grows up in the palace. And we're going to pick up this story. We're skipping when Moses is 40. And this is kind of wild because Moses lived to be 120. So his story is like beginning at 40. Guys, 40 is the new 20. 40. So if, you, if you're 40, guys, the story is just beginning. This is when Moses is 40 years old in Exodus 2. It says, many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews. And he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend, Moses said to the one who had started the fight. The man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses was afraid, thinking everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened, and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. 
Now, again, if you've heard this story, we know the end already. We know where this is going. Um, one of the most famous Bible stories is the, the parting and crossing of the Red Sea. So we, we know that there's liberation coming. And also we know from Stephen's account later in Acts 7 that Moses had an idea of his role in liberation, that even though he had grown up in the palace, he knew where he was born, he knew the oppression that was taking place, um, and he knew that he had a role to play in this liberation work. Um, and I can imagine the confusion and the tension, the way that he's approaching, right? Um, what we see here is Moses... Um, Again, knowing, okay, I'm part of this liberation work, but going and acting as soul liberator. He, he goes and sees something that is clearly wrong. He sees the injustice of what's happening, which, to be clear, is a good thing to see injustice as wrong, to call that out. But then the way that he did it, killing him, not good, right? Calling on justice, bad, or good. Killing him, bad. Okay, on the same page. So... But the, the, so what he is seeing, also to be clear, the, the, the beating of the Hebrew by the Egyptian, the word that's talking about beating is actually to, to take his life. So um, he's witnessing a killing. And so for him to murder a murderer makes him a murderer, right? The, the way that he's working out liberation on his own is actually not justice. Like, that's not freedom. That's not leading to liberation. And the way that he's doing it on his own is, is not the way that when we talk about God's, God's story of liberation, it's so much bigger than what we can imagine on our own. It's so much higher. In the um, same way Isaiah says that God's ways are higher and far beyond anything that we can imagine, God's idea of liberation doesn't even begin to resemble what we think we can do on our own. Does this make sense? So he was acting that out in his own strength. Now we're going to skip another 40 years, I know. So now we come back to Moses as an 80-year-old. Any, any 80-year-olds? It's the new 40. You're good. He's, Moses lives a good long life. And Moses, now as an 80-year-old man, remember he, he fled. He went into the land of Midian. We find him under very different circumstances here in Exodus 3, verse 1. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. Let's pause here. Um, because he went from Pharaoh's palace to now taking care of somebody else's sheep. Like, he had people probably that were attending to his needs, and now he's in the middle of nowhere. This isn't even his flock. He's, he's taking care of someone else's flock. Um, this is a huge demotion. He's in, the, he's in the wilderness, and when we see wilderness in Scripture, it's often used in both the Old and the New Testament. We see wilderness come up as this place that is barren, and yet often we see stories of the wilderness as a place where there's an encounter with God, where there is transformation that takes place, even in the middle of nowhere. And this is true in Moses' story as well. The next, the next verse. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now first, Moses notices this phenomenon, this bush that is burning without burning up, right? It's the, a reminder to pay attention, even especially when we are in places of wilderness. 
Next, as he comes closer, God is calling to him, Moses, Moses. And we know that in scripture, when, when God repeats a name, like we pay attention. This is important. And he's calling him by name, even though he's like in the middle of nowhere, even though Moses has a past, right? That he's been running away from. God finds him, calls him by name. He knows exactly who he is. And we hear Moses' response, here I am, a posture of willingness, and availability. And finally, I love this, that God reminds Moses of the family and the story that he is a part of. He says, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I know you, Moses. I know your family. I know where you've come from. And I know who you are. And to show that God knows exactly who Moses is. In fact, he knows everything about him. He knows what happened. He knows when he, he saw injustice and what happened there. God gives Moses this reminder. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I love that it's like, do you think I don't know? Yes, I know. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go. For I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. And what we see here is that God is the one doing this liberating work. God is the liberator in God's story, right? That before we saw Moses trying to take that on. But what we know of God's story, his ways are so much bigger. He is the one that's doing this work. And it is in God's story. He says, I have certainly seen. He says, yes, I am aware. And if you read through the rest of this chapter, you see this conversation between Moses and God continue. Moses protesting over and over and God continuing to remind him of who he is. And, and there's uh, over nine instances of God just saying this over and over. Yes, I am. I am the one. Yes, myself, I will come rescue. Um, God is the one doing this liberating work. And we see this shift, and most of us know a little bit of the next parts of this story, miracle after miracle, culminating in that story, the, the parting of the Red Sea, and God liberating the Israelites from their enslavement toward the promised, man, promised land. Now, was Moses the one that made that happen? Was Moses the one doing that with his own hands? No. But did God choose to seek out Moses as one to bring liberation through Moses? Yes. And so God's story of liberation also includes us. Like we get to be part of this greater story. And it's deeply intertwined with our stories. Our stories are so connected to one another. When we look at God's story through the life of Moses, if we frame it this way, we see God's story through, through Moses connected to God's story through the midwives, right? That's part, part of how Moses was alive. <laughs> like the, the resistance of those midwives. Um, God's story through Moses is connected to God's story through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God's story through Moses is connected to all of these other pieces in the same way all of our stories are connected. It's so much bigger than us, and yet it includes us. God includes all of our stories as well. Our stories are tied to our brothers and sisters around the world that are also desperate for liberation and for freedom. Like we cannot move forward without one another. When we are seeking liberation, it is tied to one another's freedom. And this is the invitation is for us to hold a bigger idea of God's story. Um, we, tend, we tend to look inward at our own stories, but what if it's actually all connected how, how are we going, what are we doing with this invitation from God? 
to see this as a bigger picture and see our story in the midst of God's larger story. And one beautiful example of how I'm seeing this play out right now of us being all connected is through Elevate Freedom. Now, you guys know I love Elevate Freedom. Um, if you know of this fundraiser we do that supports our partners not abandoned, um, you know that my team is winning right now in the Elevate Freedom fundraiser. Pastor Laura, if you're watching, you can just go check right now. I think we're winning. Um, Elevate Freedom is a fundraiser that supports not abandoned, uh, which their work empowers and equips women trapped in exploitation, um, helping them t- along a path toward freedom. And when we, we walk and we step, it's in solidarity with these women. When we're tracking our steps, it's in solidarity. Our stories are connected. We have at least 90 people that are participating in Elevate Freedom this year. That's over three countries involved, four states involved. We are doing this together, and it's not just our stories that are impacted by this. And I want to share some of the overlakers that that have been part of this story, walking, hiking, tracking um, our steps together. If you, we're about halfway through, but if you want to join, you can still join my team. It's still open. You can join. See me after. But one thing I love about Not Abandoned's work, the, the, the organization that we're supporting and partnering with, is that their work, they, they are very careful about their language as well. That they do not say, we are the rescuers. We're, we're here to rescue you. It's about empowerment and equipping and support. Because they know they are not the liberators. We are connected to this larger story that God is writing. And a lot of the work of Not Abandoned is through their freedom centers. They have two in Thailand, and they have one in Algeciras, Spain. And so I want to share a story from the freedom center in Spain. We have a photo um, of this freedom center. And here's an excerpt of a story from the Not Abandoned staff. No puedo creerlo. I can't believe it. This young woman stares down at her plate. Tears start to form in her eyes in joyful disbelief simply because she is eating a hot meal. She hasn't yet comprehended that she will finally leave behind the violent man and the drugs used to hold her captive for a decade. We sit with this woman in our Algeciras Freedom Center and offer her a couple choices for how she'd like to proceed. Now listen to this. They say, it's not up to us. It's up to her. It's our responsibility to resource and support her, to empower her in the next stage of her life. And she ultimately makes the choice to leave the city immediately, even though we would have rather spent more time with her at the center where she could receive support during this transition out of exploitation. But we understand that she gets to decide. And if and when she is ready, we will always be here to offer more practical care, more enduring love, and more resources. And the story goes on to talk about the ways that the staff came alongside to empower, to support, to to go along with this woman, to confront her controllers, to, to get back her ID, her belongings, to be able to lead her in a path toward freedom. And I love... These final words, the woman, as she's, as she's leaving, there's a, a picture I wish I could show of the woman's bus ticket as she's leaving. And she says, I can't believe this. I am free. I am finally free. And it's not abandoned attitude where they say, we're not the rescuers. Our liberation's connected to yours. Our story's connected to yours. So it's not up to us. It's up to her. She, um, they, they gave her, equipped her, with the ability to make that decision. And they said, yes, and we'll empower and support you in all of those ways. And if you are participating, if you're one of the 90 participating in Elevate Freedom, your story is connected to that story of liberation. If you have supported Not Abandoned, if you've been on a trip to one of those three freedom centers, I know there are a lot of us that have, you are connected to these stories, these greater stories of liberation. If you are connected to Overlake Christian Church, if you're in this room today, you are connected to this story of liberation. There are countless stories in this room, countless stories of the work that God is doing in and through us. And we are connected. We are deeply intertwined. 
Our stories are connected to one another, but God is the one that is authoring this story. God is the one that is doing this liberation work. And because we are connected in liberation, our resistance to oppression is also connected, right? Like Pastor Neely was talking about last week, anything that oppresses the freedom to flourish for humanity, that's not from God. And, and I, I ask that God would give us the clarity that Moses had to clearly see injustice and to call it for what it is, injustice. And the humility to recognize God is the one that's going to do the saving. God is the one that's doing the rescuing. God is the one that's doing the liberating. And would we be available like Moses when God says our name, that we say, here I am. How can I participate in the work that God is doing? How can we be ready and able to, to show up in the ways that are uniquely for us? Because God knows everything about us. He knows every bit of our stories. God's story through the life of Moses shows God's character as one who hears and saves and liberates. This is our God. And Moses was in that desert wilderness for 40 years when he had this encounter with God in the bush. Immediately after, we see God's story of liberation continue through the life of Moses, through the exodus and the parting of the Red Sea. And I love the similarity we can see in the life of Jesus. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and immediately coming out of the wilderness, the first thing he does the first thing he does is he talks about God's story of liberation. He goes and he recites these words from Isaiah of this story of liberation. That's, that's, in, that's in all of scripture. God has always been about liberation. And this is what he says in Luke 4. Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Amen. And in the same way, the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. If you have said yes to Jesus, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is here. And now we get to say this. We get to sing these words. And Pastor Royce is going to lead us as we sing these words, recognizing that God is the one writing this story, and we get to be part of that liberation work and part of God's greater story. So would you do this? Would you, would you stand for a moment as we briefly sing, sing these words and sing this scripture together? Spirit of God is upon me. He overflows his salvation. He's pouring rivers of justice. He's gonna shake the foundations. The Spirit of God is upon me. He overflows with salvation. He's pouring rivers of justice. He's gonna shake the foundations. Spirit of God is upon me. He overflows with salvation. He's pouring rivers of justice. He's gonna shake it. Spirit of God is upon me. He overflows with salvation. He's pouring rivers of justice.